Hello, and welcome to Matner's Movie Musings. My name is Scott Matner, and today we'll be discussing four new movies recently released to theaters, including Bad Boys for Life, The Gentleman, Just Mercy, and Doolittle. Uh, our first movie is Bad Boys for Life, uh, the third in the uh, Bad Boys uh, movie franchise. And I have to say, uh, this is not the movie I was expecting. Uh, it's certainly a far cry from the excess and flamboyance of uh, Bad Boys 2. And uh, it's been 17 years uh, since the release of that sequel. And it's going on uh, 25 years uh, since the release of the original, uh, which was a surprise hit that launched the career of uh, its two stars, uh, then TV stars, uh, Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. And uh, in that time since the release of the original, uh, these, uh, I mean, the actors, of course, have gone on uh, to great success um, and uh, with their movie careers. Uh, but these, these characters in particular um, have seemed to stuck with us in, in a strange way. Uh, I mean, especially given the fact that these two films aren't, you know, they aren't great films. Um, you know, they, they're not, uh, they don't really uh, break the mold or really elevate, you know, the genre uh, in any way. Um, although they are, you know, good action films in their own right. Um, but uh, they, you know, uh, while I do really enjoy, you know, Bad Boys, Bad Boys 2 was, you know, just a, seemed to be an exercise in overabundance. Uh, but uh, what, what really, you know, stuck out of that film uh even more so than the original was you know these characters uh and uh the the personas of of the of its stars um and you know their performances and uh they you know they've seemed to only grow more beloved and more reverent over over the years uh and it's something that this film really takes note of and really builds upon um <clears throat> you know this is a uh, slick sharply focused and, and deeply serious action picture um, I mean even if the action sequences are uh, very intense and uh, realistic um, <clears throat> uh, the plot uh, involves uh, an assassin who is targeting uh, you know law officials of various ranks and uh, Mike Lowry uh, played by Will Smith uh, turns out to be a target um, of the assassin and uh, when he uh, he does get shot uh, and survives uh, after after surviving, um, he pleads with uh, Marcus, uh, played by Martin Lawrence, uh, his longtime partner, uh, who is uh, considering retiring. Um, Mike pleads with him to go on one last uh, ride with him and in order to track down this assassin. And uh, they are aided by a group of young modern officers known as Ammo. And uh, I, re I really like these characters as well. Uh, it's interesting how the film uh, handles this uh, young and old uh, relationship and kind of uh, it doesn't really uh, succumb to any of the cliches like passing the torch um, or uh, making it this you know old versus new uh, type thing, although there are many jokes um, at each other's uh, expense. Um, but this just further uh, solidifies these characters um, as uh you know being being older um and and that's kind of the approach that the film takes um is just uh you know uh, it, it really touches on the fact that they're getting older and what that means um both as uh men as uh police officers uh you know as friends um and and <clears throat> and it's it's really just rare to see a film um you know deal with these kind of things you know i i, I was just surprised at how touched I was, uh, you know, on a personal level, uh, with this film, um, you know, the, the way it deals uh, with such universal, uh, yet underanalyzed themes, uh, you know, especially in Hollywood action film, uh, as, you know, mortality, uh, the importance of friendship, uh, family, you know, and, and the forging of those two, um, you know, uh, it really goes into how, you know, these, these two friends really are family and, uh, you know, uh, I, it's, and it's, it's rare. This is the rare sequel that's even better than the original. Um, and I think that the reason for this is it's, it's one of those sequels that, that further develops these characters. Um, you know, I, I <clears throat> it reminded me of, in that way of, of Lethal Weapon 2 in, in the sense that, that it's, it's, it's a 
further exploration of its characters and, and the relationship be relationship between them. Um, and, uh, you know, here, we, you know, th this is really the film that, um, you know, the, the second one, you know, should have been, um, you know, rather than just throwing these characters into another, you know, tired action plot and having all this stuff happen around them, um, or to them, uh, this film really is about them. Um, and it's action plot only, uh, stems from that. Um, and so it's really, it really feels organic. And, uh, <clears throat> I was just really surprised at how serious the film takes, um, its characters, uh, it's, you know, like I said, it's very rare in action film. Um, and even more rare is to see a film uh, of any genre really deal with the, you know, platonic love uh, between two male friends. I mean, we get a lot of, you know, female movies about, you know, female friendship and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, we just don't really ever see this um, kind of relationship uh you know, interpreted on, on film. And so it's, you know, it's, it's really refreshing in that way. And a lot of things about the film are refreshing. Like I said, the, the, the action scenes are just very, um, realistic and, uh, that aren't just, you know, explosions, uh, and car chases, uh, for their own sake. Uh, it really does, um, you know, seem to come from, from the plot and, and there's, um, you know, reason for it. Um, and I really, really enjoyed uh, Bad Boys for Life. Um, and, uh, you know, th this is supposedly the last uh, in, the, in the franchise. And if that's the case, you know, it's, it's a great way uh, to end the series. But at the same time, uh, it seems like this is actually the, you know, they, they seem to have hit just the right note here that, you know, you almost wish that they, they keep going with it. Because, uh, I mean, I certainly would love to continue to see these characters. Um, go on and uh you know make you know on, on more uh adventures um but uh yeah uh, but if the, you know whether this is the last one or or uh uh the start of a, a new life for the series um it, it hits the perfect note either way uh, I, I i love this film uh, it's definitely a hit and i i give it four and a half stars now our next movie is uh the gentleman and uh, now every Jan I, I explained last time, uh, my last episode, you know, how January is not the best month uh, for movies. Uh, but uh, every January, uh, we movie critics, uh, you know, dredge through some of the worst movies Hollywood has to offer. And, you know, all we all we can hope for is that something, uh, you know, substantial uh, might slip through, you know, a, a diamond in the rough, if you will. Uh, well, uh, this year, that diamond uh, turns out to be The Gentleman, uh, the latest uh, crime uh, film from director Guy Ritchie. And uh, <clears throat> boy, is it a, a welcome uh, return. Uh, after a decade of uh, you know, revisiting other people's already established uh, universes, uh, you know, such as you know, Sherlock Holmes, uh, King Arthur, and uh, more recently, Aladdin. Uh, Richie finally does return uh, to his own uh, filmatic uh, you know, world uh, or you know, underworld, um, if you were. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, a world last seen in uh, you know, uh, 2009's uh, Rock and Rolla, uh, you know, a film that I personally loved. Uh, it's still one of my favorites, um, you know, but not a lot of other people did. Uh, which probably uh, is, you know, led to his film choices over the last decade. Um, <clears throat> but uh, well, this one uh, is certain to be, you know, more crowd pleasing. Uh, it's it's a lot more um, mainstream um, <clears throat> than than any of his other films, really. Uh, his crime films, anyway. Um, <clears throat> and while still being, uh, you know, equally irrelevant. Uh, irreverent and uh, outrageous, you know, as those other other films. Um, here, uh, Matthew McConaughey stars uh, as a wealthy uh, Oklahoma businessman uh, whose business just happens to be uh, the illegal distribution of drugs. Uh, and the gentleman essentially chronicles uh, his attempt to go straight. Uh, but uh, standing in his way uh, are a group of competitors uh, who want to take over his business uh, for as little money and effort 
as possible um, and assume incorrectly uh, that his attempt to go straight uh, is a sign of weakness. Uh, Colin Farrell, Charlie Hannum, and uh, Hugh Grant uh, also star as possible friends, uh, foes, uh, or both. Uh, the fun of a Guy Ritchie film um, is that you never really know uh, where uh, a character, uh, you know, in the end, where a character or his loyalties uh, truly stand. Um, <clears throat> now, while this isn't the best of uh, Guy Ritchie's uh, crime pictures, uh, I'm still a staunch uh, supporter of Rock and Roller for that title. Uh, but The Gentleman is probably his most fun and uh, certainly his most crowd-pleasing film um, to date. Uh, I really enjoyed this film. I especially like the actors uh, and the performances, uh, you know, especially from uh, Hugh Grant, who gives a uh, you know, against type uh, performance here and uh, is really the driving center of the film, uh, even though Matthew McConaughey is the star. Um, and uh, also Colin Farrell uh, makes a, a small but very memorable uh, turn uh, as, um, well, you'll see for yourself, but it's definitely uh, a mem one of his more memorable uh, performances. Uh, the Gentleman uh, was, uh, you know, a lot of fun um, and uh, highly recommend it. Uh, definitely a hit and uh, four and a half stars. Our next movie uh, is Just Mercy, um, and it's quite a change of pace uh, from our previous two films that we've discussed. Um, and uh, based on a true story of uh, Brian Stevenson, uh, a civil rights activist who uh, has spent his entire uh, career uh, fighting to prove the innocence of the wrongly convicted, uh, Just Mercy uh, tells the story of one specific client, uh, Walter McMillan, uh, played by Jamie Foxx, um, who, uh, as is usually the case in this kind of situation, found himself at the wrong place at the wrong time. And... Uh, and is uh, now up against uh, and is the victim of that racist system. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we see both men struggle uh, with the predicaments and obstacles um, of uh, their, you know, particular situations. Um, uh, Brian Stevenson is played here um, by uh, Michael B. Jordan um, in a uh, very good performance. A very strong performance, um, and uh, he's really the the strength of the film, um, along with uh, Jamie Foxx. Um, you know, but uh, a little more on that uh, later. Uh, you know, the the problem with this film um, is uh, really the problem with most um, films. Um, you know, of this topic, um, <clears throat> or of this of this type. Uh, you know. You're, the filmmakers are forced to uh, condense, you know, a large, uh, complex uh, topic, you know, into a simple, you know, palatable two-hour story, and uh, it's just not easy to do. May not be. You know, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's just um, it, it is, you know, a tough, tough thing to, you know to attempt. And if you are going to, you know, to make that attempt, uh, you really need to, you know, hone in on, on your topic, on your characters and, uh, just mercy never is able, you know, to do that. Um, and, uh, it's actually, you know, rather sub subdued, uh, considering it's timely, um, and volatile topic, um, you know, as well as the social relevance, um, of its protagonist, uh, <clears throat> You know, you just, you always expect the film to, to eventually like erupt and it just never does. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the treatment of its two characters, um, you know, both uh, that of, of uh, Stevenson uh, and McMillan. Uh, neither man is able to, or allowed to be angry enough. Uh, they both seem uh, to be um, just rather subdued. Um, and, uh, you know, just never really seem to voice, uh, what needs to be said. Now, I know partly this is due to the, you know, the time of, you know, when this takes place and, you know, black men weren't necessarily allowed to, you know, state their case, um, or say how they felt. Um, however, even, 
alone, um, uh, you know, away from from the public eye. These characters never really seem to come to life uh, the way that they should. Um, and uh, which is which is really you know a shame, especially given you know the fact that you've got Jamie Fox and you know and Michael B. Jordan, two very talented uh, you know actors who have been who have shown that they can be emotionally you know powerful uh, before here you know it seems though that their you know their hands are sort of tied um, by the screenplay and you know and the direction of uh, Dustin Daniel Cretton. Um, who showed much more promise uh, and displayed more honesty and passion uh, in his previous film, uh, Short Term 12, uh, which was a fictional story uh, about a group of social workers uh, and the kids they cared for. Um, even his style, his filming style in that film uh, was more intimate and straightforward. Um, and it was kind of in a documentary sort of way, not, not like the Blair Witch Project or something like that, but it was, you know, in that kind of vein where we felt like we were eavesdropping on real life. Um, and that's an approach that would have greatly uh, solidified his intentions here. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, here he, he seems to kind of have, have distanced himself uh, more from the material. Um, and, uh, you know, this time he seems to be, you know, trying too hard to make an emotional impact. Um, and it just, it just feels forced. Um, I think, I mean, it partly is to do with, with the topic. It is, you know, a tough topic to, to tackle and to deal with. And the film does gain a lot of emotion from, you know, its premise. And, um, and I mean, it's hard to walk away unmoved. I mean, this is a very moving film. Um, but it's more of a, you know, a powerful story, you know, in which the message um, overpowers uh, the narrative. And um, I feel that if uh, Cretton had focused more on the characters rather than trying to follow this, you know, already set storyline, predictable, you know, you know, we've seen this before. We pretty much know how the film is, um, you know, is going to end where it's where it's going uh, once it gets once it really gets started. Um, I feel like if. And I mean, and that's probably unavoidable. I mean, this is a true story. I'm not sure exactly how, you know, true and detailed the film is, but I understand, you know, it's got to follow a certain, certain pattern there. Uh, however, I just feel like if he had uh, allowed these characters to kind of step outside the box a little bit, um, it would have worked better. And I mean, we actually see this in some scenes in which, uh, that take place in the prison between, you know, Jamie Foxx and some of the other wrongfully accused uh, death row uh, inmates. I feel like um, in those scenes, the film really does come alive and we really get, get a sense of humanity and real, you know, uh, real life, real, real people uh, in those moments. Uh, but then, when, you know, when, whenever the film, you know, steps back into court, um, it just, it, it feels very much like a, like a movie. Um, and uh, that's where the film, you know, kind of lost me um but i mean it's still a really good movie it's still uh like i said a very powerful uh moving touching film i mean the, the topic you know couldn't be more timely uh it's definitely a movie worth seeing and uh you know it's still a hit for me uh you know four stars uh i just wish that uh, you know the director had just pushed the envelope a little bit more tried to step outside the box and and have made you know more of an effort uh to really uh display the, the, you know, these characters as opposed to, to following, uh, an already set, uh, you know, film screenplay, uh, or, you know, filming pattern. Our last film, uh, is Doolittle. And, uh, we're really stepping down here, um, in quality, uh, from the other films. I mean, this is seriously the, the first big disappointment of the new year. And, Boy, is it ever! Uh, this I I don't even know where to start. Um, <clears throat> there's so much wrong uh, with this picture. Uh, it's attempting just to to sit here and just list list the ways, um, but it's also so frustrating um, that you just you want to want to vent um, to somebody. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, doing that. Uh, but I do want to just cover a couple of areas um in in which the film uh you know really really fails um 
Um, you know, this is the third incantation of Hugh Lofton's uh, beloved children's character. Um, and, uh, you know, while unnecessary, you know, we definitely don't need a third one. Uh, I could see where uh, it could have worked. Um, you know, it could have taken a different approach. You know, the first film uh, released in 1967 was a very uh, innocuous, uh, you know, musical. Um, and uh, then, of course, you know, almost 20 years later or 30 years later, we had the, you know, the Eddie Murphy version, um, you know, which took a totally different approach. Um, to the to the character and the stories um and so you know you you can see the potential here for you know a, an exciting family adventure you know in, in the vein of you know indiana jones or you know pirates of the caribbean um unfortunately it uh you know doesn't come close um to those uh you know those films um there's not really any attempt to you know be uh, original or you know uh, take take this character or or uh, family movies in any sort of new new direction uh, it's following very familiar territory um, the story is very predictable um, from from about the 15 minute point we, we know pretty much everything that's going to happen um, important that's going to happen and uh, nothing else interesting um, you know happens along the way um, basically you know we, we see John Doolittle uh, played by Robert Downey Jr. Um, he's you know mourning the loss of his uh, beloved wife who died at sea and he's secluded himself um, in his in his uh, home uh, you know accompanied by only his animal friends and um, there's a plot involving um, the uh the queen of england and she's sick and he's the only one who can save her and uh also long uh and so he's um asked to go on a on a voyage in order to track down the uh medicine that will save her and also along the for the ride is a young boy who's come upon his home um you know a, a young boy who loves animals and um I don't get too much into that, but anyways, they go on a trip overseas with a bunch of animals on in tow, and um, and uh, yeah, that's basically it. Um, and uh, there really isn't much else to discuss about the film. Uh, it's uh, pretty tedious and boring. Uh, I was very distracted by the animals who are all voiced by you know popular uh, personalities. And while I get that the whole premise of the film is that you know these animals can talk. Uh, it was just a distraction for me to, you know, recognizing the, the celebrity voices and, uh, you know, not too much effect. I mean, that's pretty much all that the voices are. It's just like, oh, that's so-and-so or oh, that's so-and-so. They don't really do or say anything that really uh, makes it, you know, important that those particular people voice these characters. Um, and uh, I was mostly just annoyed uh, by them uh, once they get to the island in which the... Um, the uh you know the medicine supposedly uh resides um there's a character uh the villain uh of the, of the film played by antonio banderas uh who while he is the most interesting character in the movie uh it's also uh an embarrassment just to see him especially so soon after his great portrayal um in uh the new movie uh pain and glory uh, in which he gave it you know an oscar nominated performance um here he's obviously just slumming it um and um last night i just i really had a problem with robert downey jr um, i mean he seems bored here and i you know i'm certainly tired of seeing him you know doing the same old stick uh you know just dressed up as you know as new and edgy uh, but it's just the same thing he's been doing um you know and uh you know of course he's he's perfected it um over the course of of the years uh you know with you know sherlock holmes and um of course starting with iron man uh you know um you know perfected it you know in the iron man series but um you know he's a very talented actor and uh you know with the role of iron man you know he really revived his career and but he's pretty much been doing the same thing um ever since i mean obviously he's uh 
reprise the role in you know many Marvel pictures, but also every movie he's done since seems to be you know that same character. Um, and uh, but you know now that he's ended his um, his term as as Iron Man, I think it's time for him to step up and and try something new. Uh, you know, it's his chance to prove um, you know his skills beyond. Uh, you know, the same smart ass cocky attitude uh, that is, let's be honest, it's more of a, a presence uh, now, um, at, you know, persona than, than a performance. Um, and so I think uh, it, it'd just be nice to see him show, you know, a little more growth, uh, maybe even, you know, do a drama um, or, or, you know, some, something else other than just, you know, playing the same, same character. Um, and he's certainly not doing himself any favors by by uh, performing it here. So um, there's nothing here to, you know, there's nothing here to distract us from his tired um, persona. And maybe had he chosen a different route, uh, like, say, you know, Johnny Depp did with Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and if he had actually tried to play a character here, uh, there, you know, maybe the rest of the film might have fallen in line. Um, but as it is, there's nothing here, uh, to recommend. And I definitely recommend skipping, uh, Doolittle, which is a huge miss. And, uh, I award two and a half stars. Well, that has been another episode of Matner's Movie Musings. Uh, thank you, uh, for joining me and, and for watching and, uh, we'll see you next time.